When we last left our intrepid heroes, we had just beaten Don Cornet. Oh, Jesus Christ. We're in the sewers. <laughs> riddled with some problems. Actually, ghost drag him away. What a fascinating phenomenon is <laughs> ghost drag him away. But the floor falls out. <laughs> I miss the steel staff. It's impossible to know where we are or where we're going now. I miss the steel sky. Welcome back to Boss Door. This is Final Fantasy VII Remake, Part 2. They drop you into the sewers, and you are immediately met with the boss fight, um, Abzu. The only one I remember his name. Because it's very fun. It's a very cool boss fight, riddled with some problems. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, but here's the thing. This was the point where I mentally confirmed that when you do a boss fight, every time you would stagger them, and stagger is a, is a core mechanic of the game. They, it's a tutorial message, learning how to stagger people. You stagger them, and then they're, you know, they're incapacitated for a minute, and you do like tons more damage to them. So naturally you're like, well, if I fight a boss, my instinct should be to stagger them so I could do a ton of damage to them. But what they don't tell you is that on in almost every boss fight, if you stagger them, they will go into their next phase, which does not stun them. They lose their entire stagger bar, and then you just keep fighting them. So if you stagger them and like hold your limit, thinking, "Oh, let me, I'm gonna do a, a massive like limit attack," after they stagger, you will be disappointed. And fighting Abzu was the was the point when I confirmed that to be the case for most boss fights. Um, because I lost so many limits and good attacks and good setup trying to fight Abzu. And also, uh, he's got an attack that can one-shot your whole party if you're not paying attention. And all you have to pay attention to it, you have to, like, look at a specific part of the of the screen. And if you're not... If, if you just, like, stop paying attention for a minute, you could wipe your whole party. It's not even that. It's the camera doesn't... Like, you don't control the camera. Like, it kind of has to pan up to this thing... For you to see the because there's a glowing grate where a big waterfall happens, and sometimes it'll make it glowy, and your camera's just like not really there, and it will just kill everyone, and you start a fight that you were crushing before. Yeah, I had a, yeah I had a, a one of my fights with Abzu because I had to fight him about three times, but one of my fights with Abzu I was I was on like speed run pace. I was dumpstering him. He was dead, and he was literally almost dead. And then I didn't notice that he was doing his water attack. And it wiped my whole party. And I had to start over. And that was the best fight I ever had against Abzu. And he's my favorite boss in the game. <laughs> um, so, the bosses in the game are pretty good because combat's pretty good. Um, but they are still riddled with these problems. And the fact that they're one of the core mechanics of combat is stagger. And that you can stagger basically no bosses ever is horrifying. Like, who made that design decision? You know? The one thing you're supposed to do, and they don't let you do it. That's in, that's incredible to me. The the other thing I think the game does with these boss fights that it becomes very frustrating is they're always trying to make you use your other characters. So to try to make you use things like Baron and Aerith, the thing will just fuck off really fl far away and it becomes boring. There's a fight in the Coliseum right before Abzu-ish, uh, the Hell House, which... Is a cool callback because in the original game you would you just get a random monster encounter. It's a house, and again it appeals to kind of the Final Fantasy thing of just like it's a house. That's so weird. Like that's a thing that you say a lot when you play these games. So it's cool to have a callback when the game is mostly kind of somewhat realistic in its depiction of everything, but you just fight a house. But then that fight is not fun in my opinion because it takes goddamn forever. It's just a very long boss fight, and it just fucks off and flies around the sky and you have to be Aerith just slowly throwing magic hoping it will eventually land and yeah there's a whole mechanic where it's like glowing different colors and you use your spells or whatever but it's like very simple like you understand that mechanic pretty quickly and then you're just waiting forever for this boss fight to end and it it doesn't feel rewarding when you fight these individual characters I think the best boss fights in the game are all when it's a person 
Reno and Rude at this point, I think you would agree, are the oh, two Reno? best boss fights, other than Absu, you like Absu a lot. I um, do like Absu a lot. Reno and Rude are probably the best boss fights in the game, though. Yeah. Um, you know, as individuals. You know, Airbuster's complete garbage. The Scorpion was at least, like, kind of fun. Right? It was alright. He, He's a starter boss. So He's a starter boss. what it is. Yeah. Um, and the little mechanics, you learn them really simply. The game pretty much tells you what they do. But so often the fight, the boss fights either do something to make it artificially long, like fuck off and fly away, um, make you feel like your strategy doesn't matter because they just, the stagger system Because you can't stagger them ever. Doesn't seem to matter at all. Kind of ruin it cinematically because there's a, t- you know, for example, for the Airbuster fight, there's a timer on it because they're going to, bl- the, they took control of your bomb and they're going to use it themselves, which... Doesn't make a lot of sense, but there's a timer, and he's just a million miles away, the Airbuster, and you're just like, you don't feel the timer anymore because you're just slowly shooting with Barrett, and he doesn't feel tense. Like, it takes the tension out when it was such a hype fight for tension. So it feels like the mechanics they have at their core can be good, but they always, like, apply it so awkwardly, even the random monsters encounters. So, early on in the game, you fight, like, a two-armed little buzzsaw thing that we kind of referenced. And it's a fun fight. And you're like, oh, cool. The, I like the, that the combat system is good for mini-bosses. But for almost the rest of the game, that's the only mini-boss that exists that is fun and prevalent. Yeah. Every other fight is like, here's some rats. And you're like, okay, I beat them in a second. I don't even know why they were there. Or like... Fight some drinks. Okay, beat them in a second. I don't even know why they were there. So the, like, minute-to-minute count, or even just random soldiers. All the soldiers you just, like, wipe out in seconds. Yeah, except for the occasionally ridiculously powerful enemy. You know, sometimes you just, you fight a soldier and he has a flamethrower, and if you don't realize that that guy's a flamethrower guy, he will wreck you. He will destroy your health in an instant. And up to that point, you felt like you were over leveled, you know? Um sometimes enemies are just are just like stupidly tanky. Like they're not even hard to fight. They just have so much health they take a long time to fight. And this just happens seemingly at random. There's never a point where you're like, oh yeah, this kind of looks like a mini boss area. It's just no, you just you encounter somebody and you're like, wow, this one enemy is weirdly strong. And again, I think a lot the problem kind of initially stems from this is what happened when you, like, kind of slavishly try to keep so much of the stuff from the original game the same when you when it's not one game anymore. Yeah. So all, almost all the enemies you see are random monster encounters in, at this point in Midgar, right? Like, almost everything is actually a thing that you see. And you're like, well, how, I mean, how strong can we make these rats and bugs? And it's like, yeah, because the game thought it was the beginning of the game. But when you have Fire Raga you know, the maximum level fire spell and you're still fighting just like dorky pieces of shit and you just kill them and they slice through them like butter, it just feels like there's no progression in the game. It feels like the hard parts are completely at random and the only time any any random monster counter is kind of hard is when it CCs the hell out of you. (laughs) Yeah. And so combat is fun, but they, they really try their damnedest to not make it fun. They really try hard on that, right? And so back to back to the actual events of the game. You fight Abzu. That was that was a fun boss fight. And then you're in the sewers. And in the original game, you do fight Abzu, but you don't go through any kind of sewer section because sewer sections are bad. There's never been a game with a good sewer section. And so you go into the, you go into the sewers, and this is the point where we got to talk about how bad this game truly looks because the sewers are. They, they're they literally copy and pasted rooms. There's a generic sewer hallway. A generic sewer big circular room. Copy and paste that until you've spent 20 minutes in there. And then move on. They added this dungeon full of like shitty, weirdly strong frogs. Uh, that looks bad. Looks like it was just copy and paste. It looks like baby's first game. If you went to a game jam... And gave somebody 20 minutes to make a game, you would expect something like this. But instead, this is a AAA title that's been anticipated for a decade. This is unbearable, how bad the sewers are. And it's just a section you don't need to make longer, right? Like, and they made it so much longer. Like, I'm pretty convinced 
that Ross also forgot about the second part of the sewer dungeon, where you have to, like, raise the water levels and walk over little platforms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's just so long. Because you do, you go through sewer and sewer and sewer, and then you just get to, like, another room where you're like, yeah, we're just... Just still fucking going here. Yeah, and but so forgettable apparently. And this again is kind of I think the part where you know Walmart has already tested her patience, and then it's just all the pacing stuff is so egregious. So you know, there's bunches of mini games we skipped over. Some of them are in the original game, like one where you pull down two levers at the same time, and it's like a really unfun minigame. Yeah, it's, in the original, you're supposed to pull levers at the same time your your um, companions pull the levers, and the timing is like almost frame perfect, it's absurd, and there is no cue of any kind for when you're supposed to do it. Tief is just like, okay, let's try again, and then sort of an arbitrary number of seconds later, they pull their lever, and you just have to do it perfect. It's just not fun. And again, it's from the original game, so whatever. I get that's an homage. But they added stuff in the sewers minigames that are, that are just insane. So there's one part where you're going down, you're in the sewers, you're walking, and all the lights are out. So of course you have to slow walk, which if you haven't played the game, I can't, there's no way for me to convey how much you slow walk, but it makes you feel like you're in mud the whole time. Not just the way you're walking, but how constantly the game just makes you slow walk for no reason. So it's dark, and you're slow walking, and you go into a room, and you turn on the lights. And that is it. That's pointless. There's no character developing. There's no anything. They just told you to turn a light switch on. And that's a thing you do in the sewers, just because the sewers weren't already long enough. Yeah. Then there's another part where it's filled with water. And they're like, oh, it's filled with water. We gotta find a mechanism to open up the water. So you're like, am I have to walk to a fucking room and press a button? So you walk into the room and they're like, ah, oh, here's the button. And they go, but the button doesn't have power. So then Tifa and Eris do another mini game where you like plump up. I don't even know how to describe it. It's just a pointless mini game. But if you literally fail twice, it makes it unfathomably easy. So you don't even learn it. It's just a thing that you have to do when you just. You just don't have this room full of water. Like, it's not character rally. It's not a fun mini game. Even if it was a fun mini game, they're like, okay, you try it three times, just do it for free. And yeah. and it's all pointless padding that offers nothing. And, you know, what we could be doing is having more scenes of Aerith and Tifa talking to each other and actually develop it, you know, maybe giving Tifa a character at this point. Yeah. Maybe a good time to do Wouldn't that. Wouldn't that be nice? And so a lot of, I think a lot of people like this because it's like Aerith and Tifa are kind of friends here. Um, they, they're kind of like bonding or whatever. But one, this is the first time the game passes the Beshel test. Which it, all that we're required to pass the Beshel test is it is a generic, um, it is a rule of thumb to just kind of litmus test if something is sexist or not in a movie or a TV show where you just have to have two characters have a conversation not about a man. Yeah, two female characters. And a conversation by this test is considered of three sentences, not about a man. The game has not passed it at this point, and Jesse and Tifa exist. They don't say anything to each other, like, at all, even though they work in a terrorist organization together. But, like, I think the conversation that literally passes it is, like, when all this is done and we can go to the surface, what are you going to do? <laughs> and Tifa goes, I'm going to go shopping. Yeah. And you're just like... Okay, you try to pass this generic feminism test, and then you literally were just like having Tifa, who's shown no proclivities to this, to talk about shopping. Yeah, Tifa wears one outfit. Yeah, <laughs> like, she's not. I don't know what she's shopping for. She, where do you go shopping in the slums? There's not. Uh, they don't have like malls inside. It, you don't go on shopping sprees when you're dead poor in the slums. Wall market. Uh, <laughs> it's the only place they have a clothing shop. Oh and we, man, and we can use it to dress they have up. good dresses though. Yeah, dress up, uh, dress up our male character because it's funny because he's a guy. It's funny, yeah, because men aren't supposed to wear dresses. That's the yeah. that's the joke. So there's like the bare minimum of our characters kind of interacting and kind of developing a relationship, but also not really. Um, and this is also, I think, it's probably more prevalent in the game. But this is the first time of a long trend that will last at the end of the game, where there's a cutscene. Of someone walking over, like, a rickety bridge or, like, a piece of rope or something. And then, oh, someone almost falls. 
And either you literally fall into a dungeon, or it's just a cutscene of like, ugh, action beat. Of just like, I didn't fall. And it happens so much, it again feels like pointless filler. Yeah. Right? Like, we get it. Like, Cloud is heroically slaved a woman from not being able to walk across a platform. And, to put the to put this in perspective of the plot, we've just been informed by Don Corneo before being dropped into the sewers that Shinra is going to drop the plate and crush everyone in the slums. Like, literally crush them. You know? There is urgency. You need to get back to the plate and you need to do it now. And Don Corneo has inconvenienced you by putting you in the sewers. And then the developers have inconvenienced you by making you do a bunch of dumb minigame bullshit to get through the sewers. And you finally get through the sewers and you're like, surely we will go to the plate now. Surely. No. It's train graveyard time now. So, both of these sections, the sewers and the train graveyard, I think are straight up three rooms in the original game. Yeah. You fight Abzu, there's the ladder. You go to the train graveyard, you go to the second screen... You're back in the slums. So, this is not egregious. It's just kind of... And in the original game, Train Graveyard is just kind of a place where you're like, oh, this is weird looking. It's aesthetically different. It's a change of pace aesthetically. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, so you're not always just in the slums or whatever. So, but in this Train Graveyard, there's a whole subplot of ghost children abducted by... I guess more ghosts? Well, it's regular children abducted by ghosts. But are now ghosts. I think they're just, like, taken into the into the Shadow Realm. Because they become ghosts, because one of them is, like, all crying Oh, yeah, they ghosts. do become ghosts. So maybe these kids are dead? It doesn't explain anything. It's strictly unclear what's yeah. happening. And but there's ghosts. Some of them are or were children. And also, they are abducting children. And... We don't know why, but it's aesthetically interesting. It looks good. It's like it's like dark, but everything's got this blue tinge to it, and it's like it looks ghostly. It kind of it reminds me kind of like a lavender town in original Pokemon. You know, um, you just go there and you're like, I'm not sure why there's ghosts everywhere, but I'm kind of digging it. Um, but except I wasn't. <laughs> okay, I, I like the train graveyard um, from a from a gameplay perspective. Uh, from a plot perspective, again, there's a ticking clock, and they're like, hey, do you want to do another dungeon? And you're like, fuck me. So you go into the train graveyard, you find a bunch of ghost children, they put out the lights, they destroy the power, and you you fight, you're just fighting ghosts, and I guess they're kids. And then you have to do a bunch of, they're not mini, they're not puzzles, they're not games, you just, like, find your way through this place. Um, and they will occasionally stop to, like, look at the plate like you can see the the supporting structure for the plate and it's under siege by shinra and you're like boy i wish i was there let's keep going through this train graveyard see that's literally part two there's two parts of the train graveyard. oh i know i know the the first part has one of my i god damn it game do we have to keep doing this we're like oh it's all scary and you're gonna walk into oh. it and then both of the girls grab cloud's arms and like uh, uh, which again they weren't uncomfortable in Walmart when much more egregious stuff was happening, but whatever. So they're, like, f afraid of all these ghosts, and then you fight a boss. And then you go to the second section, and it starts off with, on one of the abandoned trains, you can hear the radio of Shinra announcing the plate fall, which I 100% doesn't make any sense. Yeah, this is an abandoned train graveyard, and they have working radios. But yeah. whatever. Yeah, and so it's supposed to be like, okay... You know, here's the tension. And so the next section, you're like, okay, it should be a little bit shorter. And it's like some, whatever, dumb moving train puzzle. That's not actually a puzzle. You press a button and yeah, it moves forward. There's only one thing to do. It's not like you have to find your way through it. There's only one path. You just have to go press a button on a train and it'll push another train into a position that you can walk on it. And you do that three times because every time you do a puzzle in this game, you have to do it three yeah. times. Uh, well, one thing we skipped over previously that I think is the beginning of... Oh, every fucking little puzzle mini game is not a puzzle and horrible. Is there's a part where you're walking through Aerith through a broken expressway, and there's this big mechanical hand, and you have to slowly move it down. Aerith has to climb on it, and then you move her up. And it's amazing not only how bad the controls are, not only how long it how long it takes, how often the hands collide with kind of invisible objects. Yeah. Uh, and you have to move uh, cargo containers like out of the way and stuff. 
Um, and you can only put them up and down in like specific positions. It's just, it takes so long, and it's so boring, and there's no reason for it. And it's only a callback to the first game. And, and you don't feel clever. And it's no. like, it's like, not a puzzle to solve. And the, and the only callback to the first game is there's a random unanimated hand. Or um, no, a motionless hand. Yeah, there's just a big robot hand that you pass in the first game. Yeah, you walk on it like a bridge. Which would be cooler. I would love to just walk across a robot hand instead of doing an aggressively slow minigame. That doesn't make any sense because now you're like... Why are oh, these yeah, this hands is, here? Yeah, why are these hands here? It's a broken down highway. Like, why would you just install, install hands with fucking levers and... In the fucking... Right. Like they're just big robot hands. Like, what are they doing here? Why? Yeah. We'll never know. And it, it just takes a, a, a short section and makes it longer. Just same thing in the train graveyard. The first time, like, you have to move... Get a, a crabby thing to move this train so you can walk past it. So you just, like, walk in circles and circles until you get to a panel where you can finally do it. And then the second section, they're like, oh, the train's in the way. You have to press these buttons that move it. And there's no puzzle... It's literally just pressing the button the game already points to. Yeah. So you press you press the buttons three times, and they move the trains into position. Um, and you're like, maybe I can get out of here. And then you fight a second boss fight in here. Um, and I want to be clear, these boss fights are excellent. They're some of the best in the game. There's I have no complaints. They're, they're visually fun. cool. Yeah, they're visually interesting. Um, I have one complaint about this boss fight, though. Oh? He has an item oh. for Aerith. That you could only get from stealing, but you probably don't have steel equipped because it's mostly garbage the whole game. Yeah, there's no. But point. you can get one of one of Eris's staff. We have no idea how good it is. It just when you assess it, it's like ah, you can steal staff, and you're like, do I want to restart this boss fight just to steal it? And just you're to like, equip a steel material? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. We don't know what that staff does. We'll never know. Um. Um. I guess it. That's one of those things, like, you uh, you know, if, if you're, like, a diehard player and you want to replay the game and stuff, I kind of enjoy that you, that, like, bosses can have stuff like that, but, like, this game really does not incentivize you to ever learn anything about that. Uh, we only noticed it because we assessed the boss to find his weaknesses, and I noticed that it told me you can steal a staff, and that's it. So, if you want to go back and get it, like, sure, but also, you get weapons constantly, so what does it matter? You know, just you'll get a better one. But anyway, you you get to you get through the second boss fights. The plate has been under siege for an hour because um, I can't stress you've been you've probably been in dungeons for like two hours now after after Don Corneo. and probably more quite honestly. And then even then, there's a really long cutscene of like Eris taken by the ghost and turns into a child in his crime. Oh, yes, yeah. so you don't remember oh, yeah. that because oh, it's God. so nonsensical and pointless, and it's just like. You talk to the kid and it's like, oh, we helped the ghost. And you feel nothing. Like, you're like, we set the ghost children free. And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> Why? Why are we setting the ghost children free? What are we doing? The plate is gonna fall. Yeah, and it's just like, this could have been a better section, but it's always just cross... Like, every time they try to do something, that's off of the main game. Because in the ghost graveyard, you just walk forward and you find... Like, literally, the boss is a random monster encounter in the yeah. ghost. In the go a lot of these uh, bosses are random monster encounters in the original game. They just are, look bigger than the other, you know, the other random monster encounters. So, like, that's cool. It's a really cool... Like, if you are really obsessed with Final Fantasy VII, you're like, oh, that's like that wheel thing in the train graveyard. That's cool. But then they add a story element that just write new sections of your game. Like, instead of making the sewers longer, do something interesting in Wall Market. Do, have Jesse and Biggs have more side quests. Do more stuff in Sector 6 that isn't pointless side quests. Just write a different thing when there's not a time limit. Yeah. Like, your game can be 40 hours, but if you fill it with stuff that isn't just... You took the plot like Silly Putty and just stretched it as long as you can... That doesn't feel like more content because it, it's longer and longer between character developments and beats. Yeah. Because you do this whole quest and it's supposed to be kind of a time for Aerith and Tifa to kind of bond. And like, they have like one line about shopping and the rest of it is just, like, they're doing, they're physically doing stuff. Like, they're unpumping the water, they're, yeah. I guess, helping train Ghost even though they're just like... This is creepy. Like, they don't say anything of value or 
Tifa continues to only address the plot and not say anything. But, like, Aerith isn't... There, it's not like when you uh, earlier when you walk with Cloud and there's good banter, right? And, yeah. And, they're, and you're kind of introducing the character, kind of staying stuff. Like, if you were walking through the graveyard and Tifa and Aerith was like, how did you meet Cloud, Tifa? And then they just had a conversation, that could have value. Yeah. There's so many opportunities to just... You don't have to do much. You just have to do less than nothing. Or more than nothing. <laughs> um, so it's like, the sewers are egregious. The train graveyard is at least, I can at least admit, is like a better section. It's just, like everything, anything that's remotely good is just weirdly poorly executed. Yeah, it's more fun to play, but it's not like a, a good section of the game. But we're finally getting back to the main plot. You're finally getting back to the pillar, which I think for a lot of people is one of the most iconic parts of the original game. Yeah. Because uh, there's... You, you you go up these stairs, the spiral staircase, you see the dead Avalanche members in the original game, and you, f- you feel the weight of it until you get to the top with Barrett and you reunite, and it feels... It, it has... It's dramatic, you know what yeah. I mean? It feels real. It feels powerful. So based on what we know of this game, how can they possibly <laughs> make these stairs longer? <laughs> So we're going to add some random encounters into here. You you finally get to the plate. It's been hours since you learned of the the plot to destroy it. Um, you've seen scenes uh, fr- uh, from a distance. You can't get to the plate, but you can look through a fence and see your friends fighting for their lives wh- while you save ghost children. So you finally get back to the plate. Uh, Wedge falls from the top, but he's not he's not dead. And Aerith and Tifa are like, Oh, Wedge, you know, how do we, how do we save you? And... Um, Tifa's like, I'll stay behind with Wedge. Um, Aerith, you need to go back to... This is looking really bad. You need to go back and get uh, Marlene, who is Barrett's daughter, out of out of the bar and try to evacuate everybody in the slums before this plate falls, you know? And so Cloud's got to go it alone up the up the thing. There's not really clear why Tifa can't come with you, but she's going to stay with Wedge. Um, and then comes back later somehow. Yeah, she just shows up later anyway. So you you climb the plate, and it's just it's just like shitty flying enemies constantly uh, that are not fun to fight. There's nobody fun to fight on the on the plate stairs. You keep going up the stairs, you keep getting these scenes with Rude and Reno who are the ones in the helicopter trying to drop the plate. And Reno's just like very pro, pro-genocide pro in this, uh, which is kind of weird because they were, they were sort of sympathetic villains up to this point, but Reno now is just like, oh, I can't wait to drop this plate on people. And Rude's just like, maybe we shouldn't. But Air straight up says... Like, uh, too earlier in the game, uh, he's not a bad person, referring to Brood. Yeah. And then he goes, but sometimes they gotta do bad things. And, like, that, I think, is a actually really good character development. Yeah, it is. Like, you actually feel for these characters. And so then just seeing, like, uh, Reno be real hard for murder is, like, kind of off-putting. But, like, whatever. It's just... It's this game. It's just, yeah, it's just weird, because it doesn't seem to fit with the characters that we've that they've established so far. Um, but you, you go up the plate, and then you meet um, Biggs, who is dying. Uh, he's been he's he's been killed, and you have to have his death scene. It's rather touching. It's quite it's quite well executed, and there's there's some good moments. I think it's particularly so. We've been talking about this a, a, a bit. So Biggs, as a character, isn't the most developed, but you get a pretty good feel just by the way he talks and what kind of person he is. You know, yeah, Biggs is just a good guy. Yeah, you, maybe someone Jesse should like more than. Cloud. But whatever. There's a part where Biggs basically asks you, basically, tell me that what we did mattered. Like, tell me that uh, everything that we did as Avalanche is not going to be all for naught. Yeah, right. tell, me, tell me you're going to save this plate, Cloud. And for the first time, Cloud is like, yeah, like, it won't be for nothing. And then Biggs goes, you're a good guy, giving me that comfort yeah. at and the it's, end. It's really touching because that's like, we again, we see, we see that Cloud character development that we want so desperately you know yeah cloud, cloud his heart has softened and in big's time of need um he's like he's like yes i will i will stop this plate and and biggs doesn't really believe him but he's like man thanks for thanks for at least giving me that and yeah. then he dies yeah and you're like that you know, you feel the weight of an avalanche member dying you see cloud like, because before, the thing, the whole thing with Cloud is he just doesn't care what people think. He just cares about tangible things. Yeah. Right? Like money. Uh, so at the very least, you're like, okay, that's some development. 
So let's contrast that desk with the <laughs> greatest scene in video game history. <laughs> so you continue climbing the plate. You get a scene with Jesse, and Jesse's uh, she's like grenading people, and she feels real bad about that. She's very clear that she feels bad about exploding people, and then plot goes come up behind her and kill her. So you come ac- you come across Jesse who's dying. So a couple things. One. Placos, the way they do things is so random, right? They're just like, oh, we need to get Cloud to go on, the, on this mission. Let's break Jesse's ankles. Oh, we need Jesse to die. Let's just put rubble around her. It's just like, f- like, just knock her off the edge, you fucking Placos. Yeah, right? Well, why are your methods so inconsistent and random? And so Jesse is just on the ground dying. And so Tifa, who seemingly has never met Jesse, <laughs> and Cloud are both leaning over Jesse. And she, and as she's dying, they're like, you know, we're going to get through this. And she's like, I just wanted you to have mom's cooking all together one last time. And no joke, Cloud reads it almost exactly like this. Yeah. You owe me a pizza. <laughs> like, it's just... <laughs> I know it's a, I know it's a, sort of an infamous scene at, the, at, at this point, but it is incredibly funny for Jesse to be dying and Tifa's like, no, you can't die. And Cloud's like, yeah, you'll be fine. You owe me a pizza. Yeah. And it's just so out of the blue. It's incredible the read they took on that. Uh, the fact that they even wrote that, you know. I told you it'd be a plot point. Cloud did not get pizza at her house and he's been mad at yeah. ever Furious. since. Right? He's like, he's like, you can't die. You owe me a pizza. And even if it was read correctly, it's a bad line. It's like, a bad what, line. Like, what... Imagine those being the last words These you hear. These are the last things Jesse ever hears. Yeah. Because she is dead. Yeah, the, the weight of her actions weighing on her soul as as she tried to save the planet, doomed everyone that who lives where she lives into being crushed by a giant plate. And Cloud is like, pizza. Yeah. And then she's still like, I'd still... Fuck you. Because <laughs> that's her only personality. Yeah, she, she is still thirsty in this scene. It's it's very obvious. And that's Jesse's death. And so we, we finally continue up. We get to the top of the plate and meet with Barrett. And we have a fight, another boss fight with uh, Rude and Reno. And that is also super fun boss fight. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think at one point, uh, Reno is about is going over to the plate thing to like push it to the buttons to make it fall. And you're like... Are going to stop him, but ghosts get in the way again because yeah. this game is just full of like you do something that accomplishes something, and you're like, yeah, you saved the day. And ghosts are like, can't save the day that hard. We have to make this plate fall, and it's all sort of pointless. While this is happening, another classic this game is, is happening is you get to control Aerith for the first time. You get to control a non-cloud for a bit. You have to go and get Marlene, and there's you know a bunch of cutscenes with Wedge and stuff. Where it's kind of trying to show, you know, the ground level and the consequences. Except for, literally everyone just escapes. Like, you just help everyone. Yeah, everybody just gets out. Escape Sector 7, which kind of undermines, like, the weight of the actions that you as Avalanche accomplish. You do have a, a, a good, actually good wedge scene for the first time we're just talking about cats are being fat. Where he, like, yells at a guard being like, you have to let these people go. And you kind of see Wedge, like, forcing his way to actually have an impact on the people around him. And I really like that. Yeah, and he's successful. Because the, these are, like, Shinra guards. And they're like, they're like, no, sir, you can't come through here. And Wedge is like, everyone's going to die. Let them through, or I will fight you. Yeah, and he's you just know? kind of screaming. Yeah, and, and, the, and the guards, and even the... He doesn't have to fight the guards. Like, they have a, a legitimate change of heart. Like, these guards are better characterized than some of the main characters. Because they're like, yeah. yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Like they they can like they can see what's happening at the at the the pillar, and they're like, yeah, maybe we should get everybody out of here. You yeah, know? and they do, and it's like it's actually a good scene. But then to contrast that, we're just Aerith going to seven seven, and you're like, like at, which becomes such a prevalent thing in this game. You see your destination in front of you. <laughs> you're like, look, I am very close. I can go back to the dramatic tension in a fucking helicopter falls in your path to block you to make you go around yeah and then you nothing take happens when you go around you just have to do it because you know it takes longer it just takes longer you take a circuitous route to get to seventh heaven 
Instead of coming in from the right, you basically have to come in from the left. And all it makes you do is wander there slowly. And then eventually when you get to 7th Heaven and you go and rescue Marlene, you, the audience, are like, you know, Wedge really should have been doing this. Because Marlene, I think Marlene straight up says, Dad told me not to talk to strangers. <laughs> He's like, I'm a friend of Tifa. And again, it's like this scene that you lose the dramatic tension of the plate falling. They're just very slowly all evacuating the Sector 7 area. It's everyone, like, they're literally all just leave and they're just like, okay, I guess no one's gonna die here. Whereas when you play the game originally, it's very fast. There are not random monster encounters for, I believe, almost all of the stairs. Yeah. You just walk up and you talk to little NPCs. And then you get there and then it happens and you zip line away and then you're dealing with the consequences. Here, you constantly fight people. You bitch at your dead friend for not getting you pizza. You slowly have to walk to Seven's Heaven. And these scenes in by themselves don't have to be bad, but they just took a, you know... Shinra, when they storm the plate, shouldn't take that long. But, like, at this point, the game has shown you, like, at least two and a half hours of them trying to take the plate down, which makes even less sense because later they frame the people of Avalanche for doing it. Yeah. And at some point they'd be like, yeah, but they were like, how, like, we were all there. Yeah, everybody could see it, and the people from Avalanche that we know from the TV were shooting at this helicopter, and then the helicopter, like, landed on the roof and the plate exploded. And also, it's like, wh- why are they doing all this? Like, why are they trying to fight all the Avalanche members? Because they can just go to the roof and hit the uh, blow up the pillar button that exists up there. It's just so much. And it's the good part about, I think, the game initially is just, the sh- again, the sharp change in tone. Because in the other game, you're not that far removed from Wall Market. And you just walk kind of to the plate. And then you're like, fuck, people are dying. When at the- before in the game, you were just kind of like doing goofy shit. And then the plate falls, and you're like, wow, this is like the stake. Like, it is a stake raising moment for the game. Yeah. Which, obviously, it's supposed to be a stake raising moment here. But it is so drawn out and circuitous, you just. You, you lose the sense of caring anymore. Yeah. There's no, there's no sense of urgency because it takes you so long to go up the. It takes you so long to even get to the plate, and then so long to get up the plate. And by that point, literally everyone's evacuated. And you're not even sure, like, what you're fighting for anymore. And they... Yes, of course they drop the plate. They have to, right? But... You ghost make sure it happens. Yeah, ghost make sure... Ghost make sure the plate falls. Um, but, like, really nobody dies. And it's not... I mean, it's bad, but it's not like a... It's not like a massive tragedy, yeah. you know? Ex- except for Jesse and Biggs, but also not even Biggs somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Biggs is, is uh, actually alive. Um, so is Wedge. For a while. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it just kind of like it just it just doesn't have the same weight that it initially does. Obviously, the plate falls. We uh, we and now narratively we need to deal with the fallout of that, right? Everybody in the slums is alive. They have to deal with that. They lost their homes. We lost uh, our bar and our friends and our cause um, as a as a group. We may like is Avalanche what's left of it, which is just Cloud Tifa and Barrett and like Cloud wasn't even really part of Avalanche are they going to stay together how are they going to deal with this as a group how are they going to come together and become a stronger unit for it um so Barrett remembers that he has a daughter and he's like he's like Marlene 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 I have to go I have to go find Marlene and Tifa's like well we sent Aerith to to go get her out but we don't know we don't know what happened and he looks to Cloud and he's like look I don't care if it's true or not just just tell me that my daughter is safe. Just just give me that. And this is such... Like, for me, it's such an obvious callback to Cloud's moment with Biggs. Where Biggs is like, hey man, thanks for giving me that comfort. And Barrett is sitting here, pleading with Cloud. Like, look, my daughter might be dead. Just tell me she's not. And Cloud just walks past him. He just walks away like, like ah, fuck you, Barrett. And just... Just leaves. And they're like, no, you had... We had a moment. We almost had character development, right? This was such an obvious setup and payoff. Biggs, Biggs is like, hey, thanks for giving me that comfort. And then later, Barrett's like, I need comfort from you. And Cloud's like, fuck you. And that's it. Like, it's so stupid how bad they characterize this, this, this moment. And like, there's, no, there's no 
there's no repercussions for this. They're just, you know, they just work it out eventually. And it, it's infuriating to me because there's this beautiful moment they could have. And they just refuse because they're like, oh, I forgot Cloud's got to be an asshole. And so they just turn Cloud back into an asshole. Every bit of character progression, which was very little, let's be clear, has now been reversed and will never come back. It's like they don't recognize any of the things that they did were good, so they can't really call back on them. Yeah, again, I think they just do good things in this game by accident. And again, this is an interesting, this should be an interesting part, because it's, the thing about the Avalanche is they're there for the planet, not for the people of Midgar. Because these reactors are ruining the planet, not the citizens. But to blow up these reactors, they're hurting the citizens. But you don't actually feel them hurting the citizens because you see them all escape, right? You only see the people who get hurt are people who straight up work for Avalanche, which is something they signed up for. It is a harder pill to swallow to be like, we literally killed our neighbors, because we think we're more important than they are. Like, we think our cause is more important than their lives. And that's just not reflected in the game when everyone can escape. It only goes down to their own personal consequences and mostly don't suffer many. Because there's no point during this whole section, right, where Cloud goes to Barrett and is like, yeah, we saw Jesse die. Right, like yeah, Baron still doesn't know that everyone's dead. Yeah, and it starts off. I mean, I there is a scene where he's shouting, you know, about Biggs or Jesse or whatever, and then it goes straight to Marlene, which is you know, logical. But this this whole chapter is basically you rushing to Almira's, which is Eris's mom's house, to check on Marlene, her being alive, and then that's it. Like that's the whole chapter, and then we have maybe one more scene where we kind of consider the weight of what we're doing and then it's just a pointless fucking bullshit yeah exactly um and then from for the next like couple of chapters you 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 go back to Aerith's mom's house you get exposition you find out Aerith's been captured I think you go on a ghost date is this the ghost date part? It's an optional ghost date so this is the part for the whole like the love mechanic in this game in the original game you have a date in this game it depends it's Tifa or Aerith will show up and you talk to them outside. If you get Tifo, she just like cries really loudly, which is reasonable, but it's also in the guise of the day. If it's Aerith, who is gone and captured by Shinra, which I don't think we mentioned, um, is literally captured by Shinra, she, she just shows up as a ghost. Yeah, she, she just, I guess she talks to you through the life stream or something, but she just kind of, she just kind of shows up and she's a ghost or a dream or something um a hologram and then yeah. and then she goes on a date with cloud for the night and that's it um we get exposition we find out that she's like an ancient which is nothing um uh, they're you know they're a, a metaphor for like indigenous people or whatever they're just they're people in tune with the planet the originals the precursors you know whatever you want to call these these sorts of archetypes also it's so fucking frustrating because this should be the chapter we can spend the most time on. It should be the longest chapter in the game. It should be the chapter because we're most dealing with the emotional nuance of what's happening. Yeah. And it is by far the shortest. Yeah, I forgot it existed. Um, yeah. It's just it's there just to have like an exposition about why they captured Aerith. Um, and then we go into uh, side quests, which this chapter, um, chapter 14? Mm-hmm. Yeah, chapter 14, it took me six hours to complete it, and it's nine side quests, all of which are bullshit. It's supposed to be quests that, like, help the people who are suffering, um, but, like, one of them is, like, go fight Behemoth in the sewers, which is a strangely easy boss fight. Another one is, um, go save kids, um... From a, in a graveyard, who are also tr like been captured by train ghosts, but it's not the train graveyard. They're just in a regular graveyard. There's more ghost captured. children. They've been captured by ghosts, and you have to save them from ghosts. 
One of them is just find a bunch of specific music discs and play them at a jukebox in, like, an open area. That, really like, helping people deal with the trauma. Yeah, three specific people can dance to the song that they want to hear. One of them is to get Johnny's wallet back. It's like, th- this is the level of, like, help people. You're supposed to, it's, uh, one of them is you steal from Don Corneo and you give them, like, you give all the people, like, crowns and jewels and stuff that I guess they can sell to whoever buys crowns and jewels. But you feel like in this world they would just get murdered for yeah, being like, oh, you have the, my stashes were stolen, <laughs> and you have uh, crowns, kill them. Yeah, just, Don just kill them. Um, I'm a monster. And so it it's like, it's actually absurd how long this chapter takes and how no impact it has because it's just nine side quests and they're all bad like not not a one of them is interesting or thematic and you just don't deal with the trauma of the plate falling at all so one thing i did forget about in our uh the chapter that i said should be longer that was really short that comes up in the side quest chapter I was like, there's nothing in this chapter, because I totally forgot about a completely ridiculous dungeon they added, where you find Wedge in, like, a weird underground facility, and you're like, okay, we the party are going to talk to Wedge and and, and talk about maybe our friends dying. The floor falls out, and then you're stuck in a dungeon where you as Barrett by yourself have to slowly escape it out and then eventually meet with... Tifa to fight just an incredibly long boss fight. Yeah. That's just like a bunch of little pieces of weird experiment guys or nothing to get back to Wedge, which is another example of we see our destination, the floor falls out, and then we have a mini dungeon. And then we do a bunch of side quests, go back in that mini dungeon to fight Behemoth and just reuse our assets. And it shouldn't even be an asset they have in the first place. Yeah. It is, it is absurd. Wedge is like 10 feet in front of you. You walk to him and the floor falls away. And that is just such a theme in this game. You will It will happen every time. Uh, even when we're playing, Joey's like, you'll notice you can never just walk straight to an objective. Yeah. If an objective is in front of you, expect a dungeon to appear out of nowhere. Or a helicopter to block your pathway yeah. to make you shimmy through more crevices. Exactly. And it always will. It's without fail. Yeah. Um couple things about the side quest is so at the very least these side quests are interlocking but when ross says it took him six hours this is me next to him making sure he was always going in the right direction this wasn't going slow and again it's the slowest by far part of the game after the most emotionally important part of the game where you none of the side quests have anything to deal with the emotion they reuse two of the most egregious things ever where they reuse the Dungeon they forced you to in the previous chapter just to walk to a boss fight. And every time you finish side quests in this game, there's a handy dandy feature that says return to the request giver to finish it off. And this one, for no reason at all, is the only one that doesn't have it. Yeah. So you have to rewalk back out of the dungeon, and there's, it's really hard to believe that's not intentional. And then the worst part about this is there's one side quest you have to do. And it's go back into the goddamn sewers yep. to help the door guy from Don Corneo, who has had no personality at this point and continues to have no personality. And okay, whatever, the sewers are bad. But it's not even just that. The sewers are now full of things that turn you into frogs. Yeah, the, the, the frog people that you fought before now have magic that will also turn you into frogs. And it's mostly a, just an inconvenience but these frog people are weirdly strong, too. So the sewers are, like, tough to get through now. And then you get to a part where you're at the door that's going to lead you out. Yeah, and and let's bear in mind, this has been your objective. It is now in front of you. We can assume what's about to happen. A pig? A pig? It's like monster. A, yeah, pig monster steals the bag that the door guy named Leslie claims to be the, the key... key. And then you chase this pick in the sewer while you're constantly interrupted by frog monster battles. Now, one, you literally see the pick stop and wait for you as you fight stuff to, yeah. s- to do a chase scene that they're trying to be dramatic. That's a really long chase scene. And then you keep fighting other pig monsters that aren't that pig monster, but you, the audience, aren't sure because the game is bad at storytelling. Eventually, 
You fight the pig monster, and I can't stress enough, this is at least 20 minutes. At least. At least. It's a chase scene, and it's at least 20 minutes. And then you get the fucking bag back, and it's a locket. And you get the classic thing this game does is pretend characters have backstory. There's literally a flashback to him being like, I know it wasn't the key, but it was a locket to someone I loved who left me. For undisclosed reasons. Yeah. The woman doesn't even have a face. Yeah. It doesn't show you who she is. It, like, it's one of those things where, like, it zooms in on the mouth and she says, like, I'm leaving you. And that's it. She has no name or face. He's just, like, a woman I loved once left me. And this is her locket. And I had to get it back from that pig who inexplicably stole it. And everyone's like, we got you, fam. Like, that's fine. Yeah, they're all cool with it. Yeah, they're just like, I know you lied to us and you work for um, a horrible criminal, but it seems like you're doing it for revenge, so I guess we're cool with that. And then you fight Abzu again. Again. You know, just because. I mean, it's, it's, like, not, it's not really different. You just kill him again. Yeah, there's no water mechanic now. Now there's a bunch of mini Abzus that yeah, like, make he, the fight more he annoying. He summons pigs. And they're not really a problem. They're, like, way less bad than the, than the water mechanic. So, yeah. like... It's just a pretty easy fight. Yeah. And then you finally get out of the sewers. You get a villain, at gu- you get Don Cunero at gunpoint, and just escapes. Doesn't really explain how. Yeah. Just leaves. Also a theme. Yeah, also a theme. If you ever, if you ever have, a, have a villain at gunpoint, they will just walk away from you. And <laughs> you somehow can't shoot yeah. them. So yeah, you, you meet Don Cunero in the sewers, then he escapes because you're bad at your job, I guess. You fight Abzu again, and then you finally get to get out of the sewers. So what's so frustrating is, in the games that are this linear, which I've heard some people say the game does not feel linear, even though you're constantly walking down a hallway, and, I mean, Ross constantly try to see, can I go in this direction? And just an invisible wall would, like, turn him around. Yeah, it would literally just turn you away. And just, and just force you to walk down the rails. At some point, so rarely, they choose how fast you walk. But this is supposed to be... An uh, open section where before you do the end game, you can experience the thing the games have to offer. And all of the slums are connected, except Sector 7, because a plate fell on it, even though there's really no visual representation of the plate falling on yeah. it. So there's a whole side quest to find chocobos to get a fast travel system. And somehow the fast travel system is worse than just walking. Yeah, well, to get to find the chocobos, because like there's stations in the fast travel system that are not unlocked until you find the chocobo... And then when you find the chocobo, you have to do like a little a little mini boss battle to for each of the three chocobos. Yeah, to to get them, and it makes you walk across the entirety of the map anyway. So it's like, well, you already have to walk everywhere just to get the fast travel system that lets you fast travel around, and you can only use that fast travel system in this chapter because before that, you have you will never be able to move between the the different slums areas, and after this. You go to the top of the plate and never return. So they make you unlock a fast travel system within a chapter that doesn't help you at all. And it's also a ridiculously long loading screen to fast travel down what is essentially one long hallway. Yeah, frankly, it, modern games sh- should be able to load all th- like both slums and Wall Market all at once. They shouldn't be, have loading screens. They're small areas. I can't stress this enough. People talk about this game being big. It's not. They are small areas. And this game, like, can't do it for some reason. And there's nothing there. There's just no... It's... There's almost no areas that actually have space to them. It's all a dirt pathway. Yeah, you can Surrounded never by buildings. basically walls. And none of the buildings have anything to do except for, ex- like exactly being a shop, right? Or exactly having um, a side quest character that you've already used. And so there's no kind of like flavorly built up place except for Wall Market, which now looks terrible in daytime. Yeah, it is, looked really good at night. It's already just full of... Uh, like, you constantly end up walking in circles in Walmart because it's not all connected in a logical way. And it's full of tiny alleyways that had chest hidden behind groups of people that you can now go back and get chest. So you have to like crawl down all these crevices you already crawled a long time ago to get like below average rewards. Yeah, it, they're just regular chests. Like the, you could find them when when you first went to Wall Market, but they were blocked by people. 
And you're like, I wonder what's in those chests. When are those chests going to be unlocked? And then finally you get back to Wall Market and the chests are the chests are clear and you can go to them and it's just like uh, like an elixir or something. Yeah. It's just like, oh, sure. I think one of them is like like more thunder material or something. Like just something you already have a bunch of. And none of them are special. Like, why would you why would you block four chests from a chapter and then have me go back and get them later when they don't have anything interesting in them? That just wastes time. And then the last thing I want to say is this is there there's been a complaint leveraged against Final Fantasy XIII that it is just going down one long hallway. But on this one chapter, everything opens up. This is the same complaint for this game that everyone should have, but is weirdly immune to it because it's a nostalgic thing that we all remember. Yeah. The hallway is more repetitive and more aggressive in this game. Because at the very least, in 13, there's changes of scenery. And when the game opens up in 13, it's a huge, giant, Xenoblade Chronicles-esque area. Like, it's actually gigantic, the area that opens up. And you actually have a lot of freedom to do stuff. When this game, quote-unquote, opens up, you only do side quests, and then you leave forever, and everything you unlocked is no longer useful. The Chocobo system is no longer useful. And a thing that we haven't talked about yet, Moogle medals can no longer be used. The whole game, you collect random Moogle medals that you can give to a little kid who gives you rewards... And then after this chapter, you could no longer meet that kid because you can't go back there, but you still get Moogle medals. You will still get them. You get a bunch of them. It's like kind of what a lot of the junk is. Like half the time you open up a treasure chest or break something, it's full of Moogle medals. And so like the next half of the game is just half the junk you get is literally worthless. Also, almost all the rewards for the Moogle medals are terrible. Yeah. You can, you can occasionally get like... One good thing, you know, they they there's like some skill books and a couple of weapons, um, but they're Barrett weapons and they're bad because they're melee weapons. Um, I think you get a staff maybe or something, but it's just like it's just kind of random crap that you could have a sh- at a shop, but instead it's Moogle medals. And the fact that after the Moogle medal kit is gone and you're still getting them, you you become very aware that they want you to play this game again in like a new game plus capacity, and I'm struggling to even tr- to even want to finish it at this point. This 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 side chapter quest has this side quest chapter has been just awful. Just slowed the game. It, it didn't slow the game to a crawl. It threw the brakes on. It came to a full stop for 6 straight hours while I did these side quests. To, to put it in perspective, uh so we were like, okay, we're chapter 14. There's 18 chapters. We know the chapters. I was like, I was like, I can get this done in a few hours. Yeah, we were like, we're going to beat the game tonight, and then it took six hours. And we just kept checking the time to be like, we're just not going to make it. Like, because we were like, we'll stay up till like three in the morning and beat this game. And then we did this and got a little bit into Shinra, and we're like, we just have to, we have to stop. Yeah, we just don't. don't. We literally can't finish it. Yeah, we don't. This took most of our day of playing to do. A complete no character development. They just keep giving more personality to the three people who work for Don Canero, who are all terrible. They or like Angel of the Slums that I do not want to talk about. No, I don't want to talk about her at all. She's just a side quest character that starts nowhere and goes nowhere, and it's pointless. Um, so you don't have to do these side quests, but like the game kind of shames you when you try to go past. Yeah, there's like not you really very, want to go forward, and you're just like there's not very many side quests in the game there's like there's two there's three side quest moments right yeah it's, it's each, six, each six, one nine. is six six and nine yeah right and so there's only there's only you know like a little over 20 quests yeah uh, to, there's 21 quests and that doesn't seem like a lot especially for most games and uh, they take absolutely forever and every single side quest is garbage you do the best to- one no joke is uh, you do pull ups that one is super fun I, I enjoy those it's ones. like a little rhythm game. But I like that one, but it also really undercuts the beginning of this time where they're like, we are doing this to help the people that are, you know, devastated by the plate falling. So I guess the only way to help these like really forlorn people who just watch a lot of their friends and family die is watch Tifa do pull ups. Yeah. It's so really Tifa gonna bring Tifa up pull-ups. their spirits. And just like everything in this game, there's a small glimmer of what this chapter could have been at the beginning that it just loses sight of. Because when the chapter starts, 
you, Barrett, and Tifa leave Elmira, and there's just this uh, aggressively dressed woman or child ranting about Avalanche and how they're bad and all that stuff. And Barrett basically wants to go up and do the Barrett thing and just yell at her and stop. And then Tifa's like, we can't, and grabs his hand. And it's kind of them dealing with the way they're perceived, with the actions they're doing, but also they did... Like, there's a level of, oh, this chapter, Psychos chapter, could be fun if we actually have to kind of see the repercussions, again, of the actions that Avalanche did. But they have this scene where Tifa has her best scene in the whole game, in my opinion, of her just trying to stop Barrett from fighting this girl <laughs> and scaring everyone who are already terrified... And they're like, you have to, like, you have to bottle it up inside. And, you know, all, previous, I think, um, I'm not sure when the scene was, but I think it was right for the plate fault. A similar scene where Tifa's like, is this all for, you know, like, did we do this? And Barrett's like, you can't for one second blame yourself. This was Shinra that did this, and it's their fault. And it's kind of you seeing the characters internalize the consequences of their action. And... Before that has any time to sink in and marinate, you go on six hours of side quest and spend way more time dealing with the backstory of Don Canera's door guy than you do with the current plot consequences of Tifa and Barrett's terrorist, eco-terrorist actions. To put it in perspective, you're going to spend more time with that girl who's up there spreading lies in the uh, Angel of the Slums side quest than you will with... Barrett and Tifa dealing with the fallout of their, of their actions. We, she she gets a lot more screen time than that moment we're just talking about, and that's one of the best moments in the game. This is when the game somehow inexplicably speeds up a lot and then weirdly slows down. So I actually I think my favorite chapter of the game is next, where you just climb up the plate. And it's visually fascinating because you see the slums, you see the wreckage of the slums. There's even a part, which you think they would do more of, where Barrett and Tifa look at the devastation and they kind of like have a moment of thinking. And it's a logical dungeon to have. Like you just fight fucking things on your way up. There's a little robot boss and like that's it. That's the whole chapter. There's a little bit of banter with people dealing with stuff. It actually doesn't just look like dirt. Like, you, it's like the sun is setting, you see the scale of Midgar, you actually have a moment for the pl characters to take it in, and you, the audience, to kind of internalize your own thoughts about it. And, like, that's just a really good chapter. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's excellent, it's well-paced, it's just, it's fast-paced, but it's well-paced. You're you're running up the plate, you're fighting through Shinra guards and everything, and you're you're on your way to Shinra, and you're gonna go, you're gonna go tell them how you felt about them dropping the plate, you know? And it's... It's honestly just really well done. There's not a lot to say, you know? Yeah. After maybe a little bit over an hour of a good, clean, flavored dungeon, and you arrive at Shinra, we gotta spend that same amount of time. Just, like, fighting in a parking garage, I guess? Oh, man, I forgot about that. Of course, yeah. It's one of the many, many forgettable sections of this game, where in the original game, you just show up to Shinra, and then you walk up the stairs, and you get to the whatever, the whatever floor. But we had to add, like, an extra parking garage dungeon, so let's just do that yep. for a while. Until eventually you get to the lobby of the Shinra place. And again, it's a pointless dungeon, but I guess they're trying to make the game longer. I don't like it, but I understand that that is the crime that we have to constantly commit. Because the very premise of your game is a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, but I think this has one of my least favorite things in the whole fucking game. Because... After we had a well-paced section, whatever dungeon, there is a kiosk with a little shield over it. Yeah, like literally a light shield around yeah. it. So the key card beyond the kiosk, you the, there's going to be a little mini game to figure out how to get to it. So you get to the top and you're looking over and you see all these little chandeliers. And Tifa's like, I can go get them. I'm the lightest. Now, I like to compare this to another game that came out... Not, super contemporary, but pretty recently, Persona 5. When that game starts, you are in the ceiling in a casino, and you're just, you're very quickly jumping from area to area. Like, it literally, like, dashes forward like a shadow, and you feel kind of sneaky and, and whatever. Like, there's a sense of 
of of you know being being a thief, you know, breaking out. And this is supposed to be that similar thing. But when Tifa does it, she jumps on and then slowly rounds it. And then jumps on the next the next little chandelier and slowly walks around it. And then jumps on the third one and then is forced to fall. And then you have to slowly make your way back up. You like climb on a car, do another monkey ball or puzzle that is weirdly bad controls for literally just directional pad stuff. Yeah. And it takes a good like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, 10, 15 minutes to do a thing that should just be her like hip, hop, hip, hop across. Again, to compare it to a, a Final Fantasy game that everyone fucking hates, Final Fantasy thirteen. whenever you see these little prompts of you can jump here, they just hop at it in a reasonable pace. And it feels good and looks good and would just make you feel something better than just an incredibly slow, pointless, stretched out, quote-unquote, midi game that has no intellectual thought. It's just like... Let's just do this really... Let's just do like we do everything and really slowly get a key card in, that is locked in a kiosk that doesn't need to be locked in a kiosk. No, there's no reason for it. I don't... Like, it's really hard to get into, like, all the Shinra stuff because it's, like, a pretty bland and uninteresting... Like, it shouldn't look so bland because it looks exactly like it does in the PS1, which, in my opinion, is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> because they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's just, like, you know, black floor and black walls or whatever. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. You have limits of your system. And... This whole place just it, uh, I is again like this whole game, visually inspired. There's some good visually inspired stuff at parts of it, but for the most part, you're just like walking down completely nondescript hallways that look like the most yeah corporate of corporate places. And you just kind of wander through Shinra. It's no like nothing really of note happen. Like plot stuff happens. You meet with you meet with the mayor, and he makes you go say the mayor. To like everybody that you can see until one of them responds because it's like the code word, and then that... or you can use the little arrow on the map that tells you where the guy is. Yeah, or you could just go there. Um, uh, there's a there's a mini game that you can like you can fight in a little virtual coliseum now. Uh, apparently, that guy that you talk to sells a gun for Barrett. I didn't know he was a shopkeeper, so I missed that gun. Um, but apparently he does. I only know this because I looked up Barrett's guns because I haven't upgraded him since, like, Chapter 3, when the last time I saw him. And I just, I missed several guns in the game, so I ended up doing the, the full end game with Barrett with, like, the starting weapon. It's the second weapon you get from Chapter 3. Yeah, it's garbage. Um, so it made, it made the rest of my game quite harder. And you cannot go back ever, like... It's not like if you miss something, you can go back to it, or that it moves forward into, like, future shopkeepers' inventories. No, you've just missed it, period. And so, you make your way through the Shinra building from there. You have this comical scene of the Shinra higher-ups, uh, which include, like, Shinra and Hojo and Heidegger and some woman who's dressed inappropriately. Um, and they're all just, like, cartoon villains having a meeting um and so they've they've captured Aerith and Hojo's like I'm gonna try to breed her with like a dog or a soldier or maybe Sephiroth and everybody's just like yeah that sounds fun do that and you're like what that one person doesn't... literally straight up just goes if you need help with the torture <laughs> yeah <laughs> like if you if you want me to torture someone I'm really happy to do it I'm yeah. just just part of the team here and, and so like there's actually two scenes of of the comical evil but I think one is at least like goofy and dumb in a fun way there's one where it's the lady where she's watching an experiment and one of the soldiers is literally her footstool oh yeah and then like the experiment goes awry and then she just slowly like drags the little dog guy out and then everyone dies inside and you're like okay this is like cartoony evil but at least it's like this is kind of ridiculous but like it's just literally like the council of evil that you have to crawl in a fucking bathroom vent, vent that Tifa is terrified of going into for some <laughs> reason. It's just kind of dumb and pointless. And I'm like, it's not that egregious compared to the other stuff. But, like, there's just been, like, not that much Shinra at this point, And everything they do is just literally laugh maniacally. Like, Heidegger, yeah. he laughs maniacally. Hojo is just always just like, I could do the worst thing you could think of. And then, like, other girls just like, 
like, you know, treating people as literal footstools. And then they're, like, literally talking about, like, rebuilding Sector 7. And one guy's like, oh, maybe we should rebuild Sector 7. And Shinra guy's just like, we don't have to. We can let all the poor people burn. It's just like everything that's just there is to overly establish how evil Shinra is. Which I think undercuts the message of the the difference between look, this is killing the planet, but we have to do kind of evil things as Avalanche to save the planet, when you're just like, okay, but Shinra's stupidly evil. Yeah. Like, we definitely should be trying to stop Shinra, because they're literally beyond the pale. Yeah, it's not It's not that Shinra is just, like, a money-hungry corporation, and that should be fought. It's that... It, it's, it is that, and they are caricatures of the devil. Yeah. You know? It is just so absurd how evil these guys are. To the point where you're like, you could throw a dart at their character traits and any one of them would probably warrant some eco-terrorism. Yeah. You know? Um, so we see that Sephiroth is in the building. It's kind of just like a cutscene where like one of the Shinra people sees Sephiroth. And then no one believes him, even though we know they have cameras. Yeah, like they should be able to see Sephiroth, but I don't know. He might be a dream. We don't know. The evil Shinra meeting ends, and Hojo goes to his lab, and you have to follow him there. And then Barrett gets Hojo at gunpoint, and is like, don't you move, villain. And Hojo's like, I'm gonna move. And releases a big monster, and then just runs away. And you're like, Barrett, shoot him. And he's like, just doesn't. Nobody actually says Barrett, shoot him. That's me, the player, being like, hey, Barrett, remember when you had him at gunpoint, and you were like, hey, don't move, and then he moved? And you didn't shoot him? That's why he got away. Barrett's so like, I... I haven't reloaded this entire game. I'm out of bullets. Give me a second. <laughs> it was a bluff. Yeah. And so you have to fight a pointless boss fight, and you chase Hojo into the next room, and, like, there's Aerith now, and, but Hojo's uh, up on, like... He, he's, like, he's like up on a terrace, and he's got, he's got like, some bulletproof glass in front of him or something. Uh, so you, you end up releasing Aerith, and Hojo still gets away. It's, Actually, ghost drag him away. Yeah, Ghost Dragon Away. Um, he literally says, like, what a fascinating phenomenon is Ghost <laughs> Dragon Away. Cool scientist guy who's poorly written. Yeah, you crazy, you crazy monster. But you release Aerith, you release Red 13. This is all kind of complicated nonsense rooms. Uh, and you... I think Red 13 just escapes and saves you. No, when you release Aerith, it also just in, inexplicably releases I, Red I, 13 I, in a different room. Have better levers, fucking science room. Yeah, exactly. Like, you have a bunch of weird experiments. Just imagine that happened. You're like, okay, this one's dead. I got clean up. Oh, fuck. Oh, the, it opened my abzu again. The, oh. Yeah, the radioactive jellyfish. That's why there's so many of them. And so, uh, Hojo just inexplicably gets away. Every time you try to get near Hojo, like, some plot device happens and you don't get to him. Like, literally dragged away by... Plot Ghost, which are the most plot device of plot devices. And then Red 13 shows up, who I obviously personally love. I guess maybe not obviously, but I just... I like goofy fucking, like, cartoony things in, in Final Fantasy. And Ares is back, my favorite character in the game so far. So, hopefully, those things, you know, bring up our cast a bit. So at this point, Ares forgets she has a personality and becomes just magic plot girl. Yeah, Aerith will never have... Uh, a personality again past this point. Yeah, and Red 13 is this weird dog and he's growling at you. Now, in the original game, he can just speak because he's an experiment. In this game, Magic Girl Aerith just touches him and gives him language, and then Red 13's just like, I am only what I see before you, and talks like vaguely, like, formal and like yeah, er Aerith philosophical sounding even though he's not saying anything. Yeah, Aerith ba gave him both um, consciousness and a copy of uh, Descartes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's the rest, of his, the rest of Red 13 for the rest of this whole fucking game. It's just kind of like, I smell something over here. And just like, never develops. And you can't play as him. Yeah, he does not join your party. They're like, well, we introduced a character so late that we did not want, this is what the creator said. We introduced this character so late that we didn't want to confuse the player by adding unnecessary, you know, new character design. So a couple things. One, game has a weird long way amount to go when it shouldn't. Yeah. Like there's a, a, we are actually not that close to the end. Yeah, in terms of hours played. Two, they literally programmed a whole kit 
and you could, people found it in the code, but they just took it out of the game for no reason. Yeah. He has his own equipment and everything. So instead, you just don't get a... Which, when you're playing another pointless dungeon, it would be nice to have some vari- variety playing with a new character. But instead, we have a character who kind of fights in combat, but you can't control. But if you play Kingdom Hearts and you're used to Nomura's NPCs who fight for you, you might understand how effective he is. Yeah, absolutely not. I spent a lot of time wondering if Red 13 actually fought. As an NPC. Yeah, checking the damage or But whatever. this is also true of most of your NPCs. There's a lot of... You can just watch, like, funny videos on, on YouTube of just Barrett and Tifa and Aerith, if you're not directly controlling them, just, like, standing in a corner, doing nothing, or guarding for, like, 20 minutes and no one's even attacking them. The, NP, the AI NPCs on here are so garbage. They don't help you at all if you're not directly controlling someone. So Red 13 doesn't help you at all. Um, and ceases to have a personality even though he never really had a personality. Well he so, gets one personality and it's being an asshole. Yet yeah, one time Barrett, like, I don't even know why like reaches out to Barrett and he slaps his hand away with the tail and Barrett's kind of like, what the fuck? Yeah, he weirdly he weirdly specifically doesn't like Barrett. And I don't want to say it's a racism thing, like Tifa gave him consciousness, Descartes, and racism. Yeah. But it does kind of seem that way. Because later on in the game, um, at the, near the end, you're doing another motorcycle fight, spoilers, and Barrett's like, Barrett's like, oh, it's a boss fight. And Barrett's like, look at this, look at this gigantic sack of shit. And Red 13's like, like, oh, you're one to talk, you know, something like that. Like, he implies Barrett is a giant sack of shit. And, like, they've had no interaction there is no reason Red 13 is being so mean to Barrett. And I'm sure people who are more familiar with the game are be like, well, actually, it comes up in later games. It's like, well, that's a weird time to start this thing that's not going to have a payoff for multiple years. Yeah. Like, it just that, that's what I'm sure is going to happen. It's, it's a plot point developed in a new game way later that we're not even close to coming out. And it, I think it points out why this is a bad idea to make just this game fucking Midgar. Yeah. After introducing Red 13 and having him say a line you see a black feather in the dreaded sephiroth that's here again now we have not mentioned the number of headache sephiroth themes because they're constant and everywhere and i don't remember what they all are nobody can it's just overwhelming they never say anything of value and sephiroth is terribly voice acted he literally talks like fucking ben stein it feels like it's just this <laughs> weird monotone And then Cloud starts gripping his head, and then they force you to very slowly walk to the elevator, which could just, like, be a cutscene where he just kind of collapses and falls. But no, you spend, like... Like 30 seconds. Again, 30 seconds again, just walking forward as you collapse, and then you wake up in Eris' little room where she stays in Hojo's lab. Or, like, I guess the room she grew up with, she says... There's a rumor that she was raised since she was a child when she worked for Shinra. And you're in that room where she demonstrates for now certain that she's no longer a character. <laughs> she explains fate ghost and say they're arbiters of fate. Also, weirdly, Red 13 knows because... He has all her powers now. Yeah, has, We don't know. Has magic fate powers. And so they just kind of explain fate ghost, which just don't need to be in this game. And then you're like, I guess we're just going to... Continue with our adventure after this. After our characters are sapped of personality and the stakes for this game are no longer clear. Yeah, you're like, okay, we're trying to stop Shinra, but also like, they're now hyping this thing that I don't understand, like why it exists. And if you don't know their face ghost and you're learning right now, you're probably your he- your brain's a little broken. <laughs> yeah, and th- this this particular part is very frustrating to me because uh, it's exactly what I said near the beginning of this cast, in, in which, like, the plot ghosts here don't serve a narrative... Uh, they, they, sorry, they only serve a narrative function. They're only there to be arbiters of the plot. They don't have any relation to the characters themselves. So Aerith being like, there is another world in which we exist, but event, the events of our lives played out just a little bit differently, and these ghosts are here to make sure our lives play out in the same manner makes no sense to the characters. And they handle it in exactly the same way they have handled Plakos up to this point, in which is, they just don't talk about it. Because there's nothing to say. What do you say to something like that? When someone's like, 
These ghosts are here to make sure you act like an alternate version of you. You just gotta be like, okay, and move on with your day, because there is just no response to that. Yeah, and at this point, maybe some people are excited, but at this point, we both, when we played it respectively, are just like, just end game. Yeah. Let me just finish what we are fucking doing, because it feels like we've been in Shinra forever, and again, there's no character development, that our characters had backwards development, we, everything just feels forced and tried and bullshit and blah blah blah. And so you're like, okay, well, I know I'm close to the end because I know that I know the sequencing of the original game. And so you leave the fucking place where Aerith grew up. You see Genova, and it's all cracked. And you're like, okay, Saffros is going to be up with the president of Shinra. I know it's going to happen. But the floor falls out. <laughs> well, Sephiroth cuts the floor out from you. You you see Genova in front of you and you're like, oh look, an objective directly in front of me. Maybe I should walk to it. But we've made that mistake before. So Sephiroth appears out of nowhere and just cuts the catwalk you're, you're walking on and you fall into a long dungeon. But That's all Hojo. That didn't have to be there. It also has the least fun mechanics of all the dungeons. This is literally my, other than chapter 14, which is just a bunch of side quests, this is my least favorite part of the game. Because you're so close to the end, you're forced into this dungeon that at first you think it might be visually interesting because you fall down in a bunch of like crash pods from Hojo's Lair. And then it's just ugly, crimp tinted, green, metal hallways with nothing in them, no storytelling, and you have to switch between two sides of your party... Tifa and Aerith and Barrett and Cloud, which means you probably have to switch your material between all of them the whole time, or you figure out material that might be good on both of them, but you probably only have one fully, fully max Kiraga and all this sort of crap that just makes the dungeon crawling so tedious because you do a little bit, go to a phone booth, switch to someone else, and you do it up four wards through this entire section where no storytelling has happened, and not a single time a character says, who is that guy with the giant sword who sent us down here? Yeah, no one seems to care that Sephiroth showed up, because, like, they don't know who he is, except for Cloud, who, he's not a talker. Yeah. And so, yeah, you go through this dungeon, it's over an hour to get through the dungeon. You fight, like, the dumbest boss fight of the game, which is just this big metal fish... And he's, like, Im he's basically immune to, to uh, weapon attacks. Like, if you attack him, you literally bounce off, which is, I think, the only enemy that happens with. But he's real, 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 real weak to Thundaga. And everybody's got Thundaga because it is the single most useful spell in the game. Uh, because more than half the enemies, I think, are, are weak to it. So I when I did it, I just had Thundaga on both my parties, and I just decimated that fish in seconds. And that was it. That was a boss fight. And you finally get out of that place. And where you end up is the catwalk that Sephiroth slashed out from you over an hour ago. But Genova's gone now. Because, like, Sephiroth stole her? Something like Maybe released her? I don't know. Who, who knows? But the point is, you had an objective in front of you for the nth time. You took two steps towards it. Some absurd thing made the floor fall out. You went through an hour-long dungeon to end up just where you were. And then you can proceed. And the dungeon has no consequence or bearing on the plot. You don't learn or gain anything from doing it. It's just there to waste another hour of your time. It would actually be a pretty good time to figure out how Red 13's mechanics work. Yeah, it seems like a really good time that like maybe you could play this Red 13 character. And even if it's only for like that hour, it's kind of worth doing, right? If you're making a cool game like this... You could do it and establish it, um, like a fighting style for him and things like that. You could kind of you could use this to characterize him because he never says a word the whole time. So you could use it to like maybe turn him into a character and just kind of get people hyped for like when Red Thirteen is a party member in the next game, you know. But instead, he's just like this shadow that's behind you constantly. He's just he might kind of fight people for you, and that's it. You kind of forget he's there mostly. And then basically the rest of this game until the final chapter is a series of unrelated boss fights. So you get to where the president is, and you fight Genova. And it's not clear 
where you are because you get teleported to some room and fight a really weird boss fight. Yeah, so it's like Jenova's like in the middle of the room and she spawns a bunch of tentacles. And all the there's so many tentacles. They're all labeled like tentacle A, tentacle B, tentacle C. There's so many that we looped the alphabet more than once. You figure out eventually you're supposed to kill all the tentacles and then you can deal damage to Jenova. And it's not a hard fight. It's just sort over of... Over a small window, though. Yeah, over a very small window. And then she spawns more tentacles. And it's not a hard fight. And it's not a particularly interesting fight or a really fun fight. So you just kind of waste your time, as you might imagine. And, and someone who isn't familiar with Final Fantasy has no idea what the fuck this is. No, it's just no a weird monster clue. that pops up. After you beat Jenova... It has another scene that is unintentionally funny that I like to talk about a lot. So the way they... They don't really have inns in this game. They just have benches and little vending machines that give you potions and shit. Which I actually think is a cool design. So there's a little bench out there for you to heal because you're about to fight another boss fight. But from that bench, you could literally just hear the president hanging off the roof on a repeated loop of like, Somebody help me! No! Anyone there! Which like... I don't know, I've never been hanging off a thousand-story building for my life, but at some point, I would probably stop shouting for help. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's already exhausting to, like, hang off this edge of a thing, especially when it is established because you're hanging off the edge of a pole that you can't do a pull-up. <laughs> you know, if Tifa was there, she already experienced a pull-ups. Um, but they literally like, take a nap as this guy's like, oh my god! And then you help him up, you walk him back to the office, and he and Barrett's literally like, you're going to go on air and tell everyone Avalanche did it, do it. And basically the president is like, is that really all you aspire to be? Ah, now I have a gun. And Barrett's like, damn it. Yeah, Barrett's just like, just like ah, d I have you at gunpoint. Don't you move. And Shinra's just like, I'm going to walk slowly over to my desk. And Barrett's like, okay, you can move to your desk, but don't you pull anything. <laughs> and Shinra's like, ah, I got a gun. And so Sephiroth shows up and kills Shinra, which again, if you play the game, you knew this was going to happen. But Sephiroth also stabs Barret, Which is shocking. Like, for the moment, Sephiroth has never stabbed Barret before, not in the original game. Sephiroth stabs one, exactly one main character, and it's Aerith, and she dies, and it's the most iconic moment in all of video gaming history. Spoilers. Oh, my bad. <laughs> but anyway, Sephiroth stabs Barret, and you're like... He's not supposed to do that. And is Barrett dead? Like, Barrett? That, I saw this and my mind was reeling. I'm like, m maybe they kill Barrett and, like, Aerith lives later or something. Maybe, like, things have truly gone off the rails. And they have, but in a much worse direction. You know, we haven't seen in a while plot ghosts that make everything that happens in the game pretty much meaningless. Well, yeah, but they couldn't resurrect a dead body. Like, er like... Barrett has been impaled by the sword of Sephiroth. He's dead. Right? So, I just find it so bizarre that Plakos not only will prevent death, but, like, make sure you get something relatively close to a barrel mini game. Like, <laughs> like what is there? What is this motivation of the plot? And so, it's been kind of hard to, like, hold off on the plot ghost, and it's a little bit longer to really go into just how bad they are because the end of the game the entire thing is plot ghost related but they kill a character for the grand total of like 90 seconds of drama and then it's reversed by nothing by just a thing that doesn't need to exist a, a plot ghost literally just just floats through his body and Barrett's alive now like they hold the power of life and death and fate yeah. And they use it to make sure you play Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, and ankles and mini games, you know, like if Jesse was trying to kiss you at Plakos and pull her <laughs> hair away. So, I mean, this is the point where I, I feel like I'm most exhausted. And again, I've I, every second I think, please just end, I feel it more and more. There actually is a pretty cool boss fight next. Rufus, the guy who replaces President Shinra after dying, which... It's amazing how quickly they inform him he's replacing someone. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus like, I heard you died. Yeah, I am the boss now. Seconds ago. Shows up. You fight a one-on-one -on -one human fight, which are usually the best boss fights. I mean, you have to fight a dog for the first fight that I wish wasn't there. But it's a pretty cool fight. And you beat that fight. 
And then you go chase after Sephiroth, and then it turns out it's not Sephiroth. It's just a weird clone of him jumping off a building. I don't know how to describe that. It's just a thing that happens. It's a reference to Advent Children, the movie attached to Final Fantasy VII, because Nomura is a crazy person. See, there could be more said about Sephiroth there, but... We'll, like, Sephiroth is... We'll have more at the end. Well, he's never Sephiroth in the original game, because we looked this up. Yeah. He's locked in a crater. <laughs> that is literally the plot. Yeah, as you do with craters. But, yeah, it's a Sephiroth clone, jumps off a building, you chase him there, and then Barrett and Aerith get locked in a in a boss fight room with, like, a big, um, a big killing machine monster. Which is the last, which is so crazy, because this is the last boss fight of the chapter. So, our boss fight escalation. We fought Genova. That's a big deal. You, the audience, who's never played the original game, if you have played the original game, it's not a big deal, whatever. President of Shinra, or the replacement for the President of Shinra. Well, that's definitely a big deal, because Shinra's been the main bad guy at this point. Yeah. A random robot... And that's how we're going to close out this Shinra chapter. Like, Yeah, we're going to have a robot fight. And that's it. It's a barrett Aerith fight, which is a weird combo, because neither one of them are particularly like high offense characters. They're in both long range. Yeah, they're both long range. So it's not like really fun to build up their ATB meters, because yeah. you just kind of do it from a distance. It's a lot of just like hiding behind pillars, and it's not a fun boss fight. Yeah, it would be really cool if you had like a certain Marvel character, like maybe something with unique mechanics. Um, Red 13 is also there, by the way. Yeah, he's technically in the fight. Um, but he can't help. I mean, he can... I guess he can, like, bite the machine. But he doesn't really help. Bite the machine. Right? The band name. Bite the machine. Bite the it. machine. Now, so we fight... We, we, we bite the machine, and then... It was also the hardest boss fight you in the whole game. Absolutely the hardest boss fight that I faced. Because it's like and a one-shot mechanic? Yeah. The other thing that's frustrating about all three of these boss rushes is they all have a mechanic that you have to fight a part of it before you can actually fight it. Yeah. So, Genova, you have to fight all these tentacles before you can do damage, which is not hard, just waste your time. Rufus, you have to kill his dog before you fight Rufus, which is not hard, just takes a lot of time. The big robot has four little robots giving it a shield before you can fight it, which is not really fun or hard, it just takes a lot of time. Yeah, you just have to kill them, it's not hard. And again, in the original game, you fight the robot... On another ele- You're both going down an elevator, and he's shooting you as you fight it. And I understand that maybe you don't want to do this for this game because the combat system's different, but you literally gave us two long-range characters. Just make the fight a little bit easier, because, you know, it's not that big of a... It's not important. It doesn't have story significance, yeah. like Rufus or Genova. So, like, maybe, like, have a visually appealing boss fight instead of, like, a 35-minute slog fest with the two least fun to use characters, with another character taunting you that you can't even fucking use, to close out your chapter before the last chapter is nothing but menor- masturbatory Namora nonsense. I don't know, just a thought. So that's the end of, of the Shinra saga of this game. The rest, from from here on out, is um, a deep dive into Namora's own psyche, which is a terrifying and dark place. Um, anybody who's played Kingdom Hearts... Uh, we'll, we'll know this. So this is another problem when the game is trying to make a complete game when only using the first five hours of the game. So we have to get a big climactic boss fight because they at least figure out the last boss fight can't be Barrett and Aerith <laughs> fighting a random robot by themselves. They're going to put... They're going to put a boss fight at the last second before you leave Midgar because we knew all along it's going to happen you leave Midgar. But in the original game, you do a motorcycle chase scene, the only motorcycle chase scene in the original game. Well, maybe we'll have a boss fight there. For example, maybe Roche will come back from the first motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen Roche this entire time, so surely that guy is going to come back. Else, why is he in this game? Because we're on our like third motorcycle adventure, and he his entire personality is, I ride a motorcycle and fight you. By the time we're voting for our next president, we might be thinking about Roche again, because he's not going to come back for a while. <laughs> oh, man. And again, I don't know how long it's going to take for these remakes to come out, but it's just so ridiculous. Like, when the remake comes out, I mean, it's literally going to be multiple years, at least. Yeah, I'm imagining two to three years, at least, between... Yeah, at the least. And then Roche is going to show up, and more than half the audience is going to be like... Am I supposed to remember who this guy was? Was, was that the, in the original game? Was that the motorcycle guy? Yeah. So anyway, we fight a big mechanical motorcycle boss. 
Uh, uh, which is in the original game, I believe. Yes, but it's a turn-based thing while you're not moving. Yeah, it's like a much easier and more it's fun. At the end of the road. And this is such a long motorcycle scene. And you get to the you get to the end of the road. And this is this is this is the moment in the in the original game where you leave Midgar. You get to the end of this motorcycle road, and it's like a broken highway, and they kind of look out over the over the sunset at the big world ahead of them. And this is like when they're gonna leave Midgar. So we meet Sephiroth. He shows up, and there's a sw- there's a billion ghosts swirling around Shinra Tower, and Sephiroth is standing in front of a portal, and he's like he's like, "Destiny comes, Cloud," and walks through the portal, and everybody's like, "I have no idea what's going on," and the players are like, "I have no idea what's going on." And if you haven't played the original Final Fantasy VII, it literally flashes to Zack outside of Midgar in the past, but also he sees Midgar swarming in Ghost. So even if you have played the original Final Fantasy VII, you still don't kind of know what's happening. Just, Zack is alive in here, but in the same plane and time period as what's happening now. But also, if you don't know who Zack is, he just looks like a guy with cloud with black hair, but has a different voice for some reason. Yeah. And it is just, like... It is so unintelligible for the new player because they've for never the, said who Sephiroth is. We don't even. No one's ever even seen that this whole game, and it's just the ghosts are poorly explained that you might not even pick up on what they are. And this is the final boss of the game, where for the the person who's not played the original, and even most of the people who did, because there was a hundred articles after the game came out saying. Let's explain the ending of the game you just played. Yeah, that's probably one of the most popular articles written about the game after its release. Is like Final Fantasy VII Remake ending explained. It, but it, it, you can't explain. I mean, you can kind of like explain some of the stuff. You can you can conjecture what might be the case, but really, again, it's just a dive into Nomura's psyche because he he loves Zack. He's crazy about Zack, and nobody else knows who the fuck Zack is. Even if you played the original game, you probably don't know who Zack is. But he, I guarantee you, is going to be a major player in the in the. Yeah, you got to make a whole prequel about Zack previously. A weird thing to make a prequel about it. Exactly, in my and so so much of so much of Nomura's callbacks in this game are like callbacks to uh, Seven and um, Crisis and Advent Children and just whatever the hell Nomura's worked on. I mean, half of the game is is practically uh, stripped from Kingdom Hearts. The battle system that everybody loves so much is just in Kingdom Hearts 2. It's actually harder in that game because it doesn't slow time when you open your menus, so you actually have to play the game instead of just being like, I wonder what move I'm going to pick. But anyway, Sephiroth standing in front of a portal, yells something about destiny, walks through. So Cloud, Cloud and everybody is just like, uh, what do we do? Who is that guy? No, sorry, nobody ever asks who Sephiroth is. They don't care. <laughs> um, Aerith is Aerith gives some kind of exposition filled thing just like oh we have to do this if we go through there you know we can win the final I don't know what is, do you remember what she says no she just says it stiffly and, and awkwardly where she just seemingly it's like very Mel Brooksian where she seemingly has read the script yeah and it's just like if we walk through that we're no longer bound by the chains of fate and it's just like so you like kind of knew what the ghost for the whole time? Yeah, but was it just, the whole time, or is you it? You were just cool with it. Recently? Are you? Did you learn this in Shinra? Yeah, and like it's it's a game. A lot of times the ghosts show up. I think to try to look visually interesting. Like the ghosts show up to drag in the back of the church and swirl around the church because it looks cool. The ghosts are circling around the tower to to like look cool. Even though like, what are they doing there though? Like, what plot are they preventing? Yeah, it, like because they only show up to to make sure the plot goes correctly, but. Now they're just, they're just everywhere. There's millions of them. And they're not doing anything. They're just swirling menacingly. So uh, who knows what, what's going on. But they end up walking through the portal. Everybody says like a, some you know, one-liner thing. And they end up walking through the portal. And then it's, then it's just fighting ghosts. Ghost but, dad. Yeah, like bigger ghosts. And they have, uh, they, they have weapons like uh, fists and sword and gun. So you, you're like, oh, they're just seem to be like clones of the main characters and you beat them up and there's a big giant shadow monster and if you've played kingdom hearts you already know what it looks like and you fight you fight the little the little daddy ghosts so you so that barrett can use his limit to like shoot the big ghost and then the big ghost dies and i know this sounds boring and weird it's because it is 
it's not fun or visually interesting because it's just ghosts and darkness like swirling everywhere. So visually, it's not much to look at. And then you you just you beat that boss, and it takes like twenty minutes to just complete the fight. And it's not mostly because it's full of cutscenes. Yeah, it's just full of cutscenes, and it's not hard. And you have to like run around on like floating rubble. You're in a void world where like rubble just floats around. That's what you're fighting on. Broken bits of highway and stuff. It should be cool, but it's not. It sounds way cooler than it is. Yeah, and you're literally fighting to literally let the game make anything that happens in the game matter. Yeah. Without plots, plot goes correcting you. And you don't have the slightest idea at this point what you're doing. So none of it means anything to you. You're just fighting because they're putting enemies in front of you. And then you, f- you finally beat that guy. And Sephiroth himself comes down to fight you and it's actually a crazy good fight it's really hard because sephiroth is a is a absolute monster in combat he's super duper fast and hits like a truck uh, to the point where like if you switch to like Aerith to heal um and sephiroth is about to attack you might get Aerith killed by switching to her because enemies attack who you're who you're currently controlling and sephiroth can just can just decimate a, a, a party member so you really have to like plan your attacks and and do. I did a ton of counters and stuff. It was a fun fight. It was extremely hard. And one cool thing is, the party members that join you are actually decided by, like, uh, the interactions you've had throughout the game, the order in which they show up. So my order was like, um, Aerith and then Tifa and then Barrett, but other people uh, will show up in different orders. So that's like that's like kind of cool, and it's something you wouldn't notice, but. It's cool that in the final battle, the flavor they give you is, is like, the people you spend the most time with are the people that show up first to help you in the fight. I um, that. And it's a good fight. It's a, it's a Like I said, it's a good fight. It's fun. It's very, very hard, but I enjoy hard fights, so I, I didn't have any problems with that. See, but my problem with that fight is uh, thematic, because yes. it doesn't make any sense. You don't know who Sephiroth is unless you know who Sephiroth is by playing the game, but the game should stop coasting on the success of a game that this game is not. You know, like, just because, like, it's it's the Star Wars thing where you can't just, like, put Chewbacca in your movie and be like, but you already know who Chewbacca is, but we're different, like, we're making a new Star Wars movie, so you have to, like, you have to already, we have to get credit for something we didn't do. Because part of this game, and, like, my analogy for Star Wars, is it's, they're a game for the new audience. They're for a new generation who is having trouble going back and looking at these old things they have to reestablish the connections that these games made a long time ago and i feel like they actively hurt your connection to sephiroth because he just shows up and whispers stuff and you have no idea what he's saying or doing or anything means and then also it's not the end of the fucking game you're going to have to fight sephiroth at the end of the game and you literally fight him on the moon at the end and it's the same kind of stakes at the end of the original Final Fantasy VII. But literally when you beat the fight and it ends, they're like, okay, we have to go hunt Sephiroth now. That we have to go hunt Sephiroth now. And Barrett goes, didn't you like just beat him? <laughs> and Cloud's like, nah. No. Got no away. You, you don't ever beat Sephiroth. He's a plot device. Sephiroth is... is the the most obvious uh, Deus Ex Machina in the world. He he is literally the hand of Nomura, just doing whatever he wants in the story. I've heard a lot of speculation about Sephiroth's motivations in this game and stuff. I don't think he has any because that would give him a character, and he doesn't have a character. He just has plot. He just does what Nomura wants the game to do, and Sephiroth is his tool. And yeah, you beat him, and you end up on the moon, and he says like some unintelligible batshit stuff to you. He's just like, there's only seven seconds left, Cloud. Enough time for you, maybe. And you're like, what are you talking about? That's nothing. And then the game's over. There is one more scene. The ending line of this game, which annoys me to no end because there's some kind of closing thoughts, you know, we need to get to to kind of, like, explain how this wraps up. But one of the the theme of the original Final Fantasy is kind of, you know, it's about environmentalism. It's a pretty, it's people are ruining the earth. Yes. And as you leave Midgar, which in the original game is the best part of the original Final Fantasy, in my opinion, is you see the open world and you see, like, actual life in the world. It's not all just this horrible crater that is Midgar. It starts to rain 
And Eris just goes, I miss the steel sky. <laughs> and then the game ends! And they just play some completely out of place song. And it goes like, they will be back next time. And you're like... In the unknown journey. Because now they're not sealed by the fate of Final Fantasy VII. They can make a new game. Which they maybe just should have done in the beginning. Instead of calling it a remake, just be like, no, we're doing something different. It's, it's Final Fantasy VII, but we're doing it different. Just say that, and then everybody's hyped for like a new game. It's also weird to the last line of the game to be like, I miss the metaphorical symbol for the oppression of the lower class. Yeah. Like, that was my favorite part. No. Yeah. Like that, yeah, it, from, from Aerith of all people, who's like the representative of, of the planet, to just be like, oh man, I miss that plate hanging over my head. End game. And so we've switched our theme from our game from talking about, like, the relationship humans have to the planet, which is interesting, because, spoilers for the original Final Fantasy, all the humans die at the end. Yeah. Like, that, and that is a totally different message. And the end of this game is, I literally like the thing that Shinra built to keep the humans down. Yeah. And it changes the, uh, the actual, the actual goal of the future games, right? Because in, in original your whole point was to save the planet. You didn't really care about Sephiroth, you know? He was just kind of ahead of you doing shenanigans. But your your whole point was to, like, save save the life stream and things. Now your goal is just kill Sephiroth. Nomura has successfully made Final Fantasy VII about Sephiroth, which is... That bodes so poorly for the upcoming games. Without also establishing at all what Sephiroth is. Yeah, nobody knows who Sephiroth is if you've played this game. He's just a nonsense monster. And so nobody has any idea what's coming. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, this gives them a chance that now they don't have to they don't have to kill Aerith. You know? Aerith could actually survive this. And like, she probably will. There'll be some kind of there'll be some kind of fake out or something, but like probably they're gonna they're gonna change things up. But what people I don't think have noticed is that the game is now revolving around Sephiroth. Which is exactly what Nomura wants. And it's going to be bad. I'm calling it now. This series is going downhill so fast, you're going to think it's Game of Thrones. <laughs> I I think the other thing, too, was the reason I, I personally am so convinced they're going to keep Aerith alive. Is because uh, it would undercut the themes of the game. <laughs> and like that's, They're kind of really into undercutting the themes. And I keep feel like we keep forgetting random details that happen because they're all so weird, nonsensical, and forgettable. Like, Zack, who we saw before he went in the portal, is now alive. This little dog named Stamp, who represents you know, Avalanche or something, is now a different breed of dog. Biggs, who we saw die, is just alive in a place. And it's, so it's just this whole scene to be like... Fate has changed, and everything you expect is different. Yeah, but it seems like they went into like an alternate universe or something. Like, it's it's impossible to know where we are or where we're going now. Yeah, Biggs died on a fucking plate. He yeah. got like he got crushed, and he ended up in a bed in Sector Six somehow. Yeah, nobody like we never saw Biggs get pulled out or anything. He just died, and we left him there, and then the plate exploded, and now he's alive. Yeah, and you just teleported there, and then we teleport to Zack dragging Cloud back to the city, which, you know, I, Butterfly Rule feels like it would change some events. Yeah, so we don't, we really, at the end of this game, don't know what's going on. And that's frustrating, and I think for a lot of people, is going to sort of retroactively um, color the way they feel about the game. And I think that's fair. I have some similar... Uh, feeling about it, you know, if you're if you're gonna make the end of your game so bad, I think it colors more the future of the games. As a, as I've already said, I think it it bodes very badly for uh, what's to come next. And you know, just just quote me now, it's gonna be bad. But my overall my overall feelings about the game don't really have anything too much to do with the ending, right? The ending is mostly just about plot ghosts, and plot ghosts are just a part of the game so far. My problem with the game was that it's just it's wildly uninspired there's no there's no characters there's no development there's no arcs there's no there's no like meaningful 
moments as- aside from just a very small handful and they sort of die on the spot moments that should be meaningful but aren't the combat is generally fun but most of the enemies you fight aren't that fun so it doesn't it doesn't really redeem the game in a in a useful way the pacing i don't know if i need to say more about the pacing it's the worst aspect of the game by far the amount of times that that you are slowed to a crawl or literally just stopped in your tracks for every single thing you ever want to do in the game is the only way you turn a five-hour section into a 40-hour game. And there's nothing more to be said about it. If Final Fantasy VII was your favorite game of all time, you should be appalled at what they've done to it here. And if you enjoy this game, you're not like a bad person for enjoying a game. That's not... It doesn't shame you as a person. But in this critical corner of, of the world, uh, this game was a tragedy. So when I say things like, this is my least favorite game of all time, it sounds like I'm just being hyperbolic for the sake of being hyperbolic. But it just represents everything that I liked in old games and how they're being perverted by just capitalism and AAA bullshit world. In the original Final Fantasy... It was just a quirky, weird game, and something that you could only experience in games, you know? There's, like, a cat on top of a robot, I guess, and that's just (laughs) stuff that's happening. Whereas, now, they know all that things sell, and they're just repackaging it, and just polishing it as... to make it as shiny as it possibly can be, without actually having any substance. Because they know you're gonna buy this game, in the next game, in the game after that, in DLC that is just a character from further in the game following your character in an environment they've already built that you can only now get on the PS5. I don't know, but which we did find out during the recording of this, which is so frustrating. Unrelated, just <laughs> it's just I, I, we already was complaining that it was a cash cow, and they're like, we're gonna make DLC where it's just Yuffie following you in the background dressed as a Moogle. It's not even the next game. It's just the same game, but now you're Yuffie. This is not, I am derailing my own rant, but (laughs) when we were complaining during this cast about, if we're going to do side missions, just invent something new. They invented something new and they repackaged as DLC eight months like, so. (laughs) (laughs) My issue is everything about the game is just kind of shameless, triple A, shameless capitalism, shameless, all the, we're not actually trying to make anything creative and interesting. The only creative choice they made was the creator of the game going out of his way to make a convoluted message about how he could change things now without actually changing anything except for changing the thing about things being changed, which is as dumb as it could possibly sound. I followed every word of that. By Kingdom Hearts 3 for... <laughs> and aside from all the money-making BS... The game just felt like it was dragging me from the mouth with a fish hook across the incredibly drawn out plot to kind of say or do nothing with characters that weren't likable, except for when there were likable characters, they underutilized them. Or their entire personality got sucked out by a plot ghost or something like that in the the last act. It just felt like a mess, and they're going to keep making more, and everyone's going to f- feel compelled to buy them because it's Final Fantasy VII, and the conversation is such in the zeitgeist, and we just don't get newer, interesting things. We get a remake, which is a game that does need a remake, but they're going to make you spend so much money and spend so many hours on it, it's not even remotely the same experience. And all of it is just about looking have that pretty Disney roller coaster feel instead of actually having, you know, interesting things to say about the themes of the game, which it did have interesting themes in the original game. But instead, the themes of this game are, is Cloud a man or not, I guess? I don't know. Or is Nomura just, can anyone tell him no in Square Enix? <laughs> are th- These are the two themes I picked up from the game. <laughs> And it doesn't really say much, and even those themes, they bungle horribly, because every time they take a step forward, they take three step backs, because they never build off anything that they did with anyone. Yeah, and not to compare this like too directly to Kingdom Hearts, because they're, they're different games, but Nomura is something of an auteur. Um, so he has, a, he has a very sort of similar creative process in both of these. Uh, we've... We've had so many Kingdom Hearts games, and we are no closer to understanding the plot of any of them than when we started. 
everything, even ev- even up through Kingdom Hearts three, none of it has even begun to make sense. Uh, no matter how much you look at the the plethora of information they seem to put out there, and I can't help but think this is exactly what's going to happen with Final Fantasy seven. We are going to be dealing with this Nomura Plakos nonsense until the last game, if there frankly is a last game, because who knows how long that could be. We uh, we could get we could get games we could get spinoffs we could get a whole new series a new retelling of the whole Final Fantasy saga I don't know but the point is Nomura is not known for his brevity or his ability to control himself in any way and so I cannot see this series going anywhere better than Kingdom Hearts does and that should scare you and people keep talking about. Well, now that he has freedom, it can go wherever it wants, and it will be a fun and interesting story. And what I say is, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me 358 over two days. <laughs> All shame on me. No, <laughs> it's a long time. Probably. Yeah. You want to do a lightning round? Yeah. Um, so I feel like talking about this game has also uh, effectively done what the game is, which just kind of drain like, the sparkle that is left in my eye. <laughs> But there's a lot of little stuff that I think was so bad that it makes me happy. Because I like bad stuff in a, in a different way. So a couple of scenes uh, in Ross, you can chip in whenever you want. Okay, plate falls. Dramatic scene. Correct. We zip line away. <laughs> it flashes to a cat that if you were paying attention, know is Kate Sis. <laughs> who is just a cartoon cat. Who slams his fist down on the floor dramatically. He's so angry. Yeah, he's still like... Just like literally the most distraught person about the plate falling, and if you haven't played the original game, you have no idea what the <laughs> fuck is happening. It just happens out of nowhere. This cat wearing a crown and a red cape just runs up and sees the plate falling, flames and explosions in the distance, and he just falls to his knees like, "Damn it, I was too late!" <laughs> and everybody's like, he doesn't say anything. Everybody's just like, "What was that?" Yeah. And if you have played the original game, you may not know Kate Sith is a cat controlling a robot. Because the graphics don't make it very obvious. No. Secondly, there is a part when you walk around, your characters just kind of say random shit. Right? For example, Tifa always says, I need a shower. Because, you know... Because <laughs> she's a girl and she doesn't like the dirt. These people made it. So after the plate falls, you know, and you're going to see Marlene and it's very serious... At some point while you're walking back and forth, they let the voice lines happen again. And Barrett has one voice line where he does the Final Fantasy fanfare thing, which is the... <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And he just shouts it. Like, the, the ridiculous... And it's, it's a somber moment, and all I can think of, like, they just, didn't, they just kept that programmed in, and there's no one like... Barrett, all of her friends just died. <laughs> and then Barrett would probably be like, what? No one mentioned that to me. Because nobody does. <laughs> nobody tells Barrett. Um, all of the bike sections of the game are fucking garbage. And when you beat the game, you can go through a chapter select. And on the chapter select, it says, they give you, they list the options they've now listed. Right? You can go back to chapters. You can refight things. Those things. And one of the three things they listed was, you can now skip the bike mini game. Which is them acknowledging that no one's going to go back and play it because it's garbage and unfun. They never should have done it, and they knew they shouldn't have done it. And that's why once you beat the game, you have the privilege of never fucking doing it again. Wedge isn't dead, except for... Which, the ghost should kill him. So the ghosts drag him out a window and murder him. You're literally in Shinra, and then the you just see the ghost pull him backwards, hear a window crash, and he just goes, I wish I could have made difference and like the one pure-hearted character who like you kind of wanted to root for they're just gonna they, throw off a ledge they murder him off screen it's true in both versions of the game but in this game it really seems like barrett actively doesn't care about what's happening to his daughter <laughs> barrett is the most absent father i've ever seen and it th- that could be a good plot point that could be like barrett having to deal with the responsibility of, of literally saving the planet versus, like, trying to be a good father. But it just seems like sometimes he remembers Marlene exists. Yeah, you literally end the game and you're gonna go on a quest and they're like, 
let's go. And there's no point. He's like, we should go tell Elmira that she's going to be taking care of my daughter long term. <laughs> and maybe say goodbye to her. <laughs> no time for that. Everything's weak to Thunder in this game because everything was weak to Thunder in Midgar in the original game. But the original game is just a tutorial, and it does it's not that bad. It's not that long of a section to have everything weak to Thunder. So now you just have one materia that's better than all the rest. Like, you level up your wind materia, and it's not good against anything but flying enemies. And half the time, the flying enemies dodge Windaga. Yeah. Or never, Araga. <laughs> never, try, never, try to cost, never try to cast Araga on, like, flying enemies because they will just move. You will just miss. And to combat flying enemies, it's like this weird, awkward jumping thing that feels really awkward. Oh, it's and terribly un awkward. Uncomfortable. So Thunder makes sense as good on all these machine enemies because you're in machine world. But to make your whole game weak to one element is like Seems objectively bad. terrible. Yeah. It's bad and then design. also, it's so frustrating how much better the elemental materia are than the rest of the materia. Because you're like, you can get this materia that does a, a specific mechanical thing. And you're like, yeah, but I can just spam max elemental materia and it basically kills everything you could upgrade all your weapons and it's like kind of an interesting way to do it but to literally just go through the menu it is stupidly tedious somehow they found a way of selecting buttons and made them feel like i just don't feel like i have time to do this yeah every time i ever want to equip um new abilities it it's it's a time investment because they're little they they're like they're just ability trees, and they all should be fairly simple, but they give you no way to, like, look through what you have available, so you have to just go, like, point by point, saying, like, oh, do I want this? Is it available? Have I already picked it? Um, and you never know when you get new ones, so you just have to kind of go back and check, like, every once in a while. And most importantly, they I've heard people say that, like, oh, because of the upgrade system, you can use, like, even your early game weapons all the time, like, through the rest of the game if you want to. That's blatantly untrue. Your early game weapons will never be as strong as your, your late game weapons, even if you have, like, full upgrades on them. It doesn't matter. You'll, they'll never be as strong as your late game weapons, so, like, why waste your time? Also, the game does not tell you that, that you get the special abilities for your weapons if you, like, train them enough. So I had a bunch of weapons I didn't get the special abilities for for a little while until I realized, like, near the end of the game that I could do that. So I was, like, I played most of this game with a handicap because I just didn't know how that worked. They tell me how stairs work, but not really how that their their upgrade systems work. During the weird boss rush, you fight three bosses in a row on your way up Shinra. There's a part where your party gets split up, and Tifa goes with Baird and Aerith, but at some point turns around and races back the cloud to catch him falling off the edge. And I was like, at what point was she's like, I should go back, and then just turn around and start booking it. My cloud senses are tingling. I allude to a bunch of times, but I really think Jesse and Tifa have never met. Like, <laughs> she just seems way more close with Cloud, and at no point she's ever, like, they're chummy or anything. She has more of a relationship with Aerith. And then on top of that, when you reunite with Barrett, it just assumes at some point the characters caught up Barrett on all their adventures. Because they're just like, oh yeah, Aerith, like, there's no, like, and bear, like just you know, meeting a character. I don't know. I feel like it's not too much to ask for the game. Yeah. Hey, thanks for listening to our podcast. This is Future Ross here. You can tell because all the sounds different. This has been the inaugural episode of Boss Door. If you like it, tell your friends. We're gonna be releasing every month on the first of the month. Next month we'll be covering Last of Us One, the original, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. It won't be four or five hours long. Probably. Anyway. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Twitter at BossDoor4. That's BossDoor and the letter 4. And uh, I hope you have a good day.